So welcome everybody back here to the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center at the Graduate Center CUNY. Welcome everybody here in the audience and welcome everybody on HowlRound. And we would like to thank HowlRound for being our national platform um, for these, what we think are important um, conversation about contemporary theater, theater that is meaningful, has an impact, and also is uh, on the forefront of experimentation and in the search for new forms for the new times um, we live in. So my name is Frank Henschko and I'm part of the Siegel Theater Center here at the Graduate Center CUNY in Manhattan and Midtown and our center bridges Academia and Professional Theater International and American uh, Theater. And uh, today we have a great uh, New York uh, theater performance uh, company, movement company with us and uh, Lei Mei, and uh, we will learn more um, about them. They have a long history. They have made an enormous contribution, I feel, to the diversity, to the um, uh, joy that theater brings uh, to uh, our uh, city, but also in the sharing of the sorrows um, of the world, because they really um, also put the finger on the wounds and show them. And I think this is one of the great traditions of that theater of the tradition of Bhutto, even though it's different what they do, but it's their, their source, their inspiration. And I can't wait to hear more about it. It's an important day. It's the launch, I think, worldwide of the Les May archive. It's the first time they will share, or they did share screenings. We showed Quicksil Quicksilver, Emil, uh, Borders, Crossings, um, Correspondence, correspondence um, um, already today, which have never seen uh, been publicly. And uh, so this is an important milestone, I think, also in the history of the company. And with us, we have Jimena um, and with us and Brendan. And so we will have a program. It's about uh, an hour long. We have the presentation and we can maybe take a few uh, questions after. So first of all, welcome uh, to the Siegel Theater Center. Did you have the mics on? So um, how are you guys today? Thank you, Frank, for having us. It's an honor to be here. I always feel very welcome in your space. So thank you for having us today. Thank you very much. Wonderful. So um, Jimena, tell us a little bit about your company, about Le May. What is it all about? Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. And thank you for those uh, who are uh, going to watch this live stream or who see later the recording. Um, my name is Jimena Garnica. Mi nombre es Jimena Garnica. I was born in Bogota, Colombia. And um, I guess I am a New Yorker because I have been in New York more than half of my life. I share my life with a wonderful human being who was born very far away from the land where I was born. And I never imagined that we we're going to be together. His name is Chige Morilla. He's here today in the back, um, hiding, but never hiding, uh, present, but never, never here talking, but very present in the work and Chige is a Japanese multidisciplinary artist and together we have been working for the past 23 years working and living and making what I will refer later and introduce later as an entanglement and um, Chige started um, a space called Cave back in 1996 in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. That was the time where people really didn't wanna cross the bridge. The people who live in Manhattan, because let's face it, people live there for many years. <laughs> um, and, um, and it was um, at the time there were a lot of empty buildings. Industry had already moved out of New York City. Many manufacturer had been shipped overseas. It was a time where things were starting to like be moved overseas. And there was uh, a space available and uh, a little bit of what happened in Soho as well in the 70s. Um, and, um, and, and Chige took advantage of a big garage space that was there. And uh, together with two friends, Grande uh, and Naoki Wakawa, they start building walls and making home and home meaning a space where they could work and live and imagine. And I was very lucky that um, I landed in New York City as a teenager by myself. And, um, and I met wonderful people in the Lower East Side and all this uh, legacy of um, artists, squatters, people who were trying to make their homes, their life, their dream in New York City. 
Um, and I joined Chige. And uh, after now, after too many years, um, we have what we call LeMay. And LeMay, it's, uh, it's, 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 I, I have traveled to say LeMay is an organization. LeMay is a company. LeMay is this. I will say it's a living entity and is a living organism that change and transforms depending of the internal and external dynamics. And of course, as a living entity is what is allow us to have a life as artists and to, um, to have resources to create and a structure to create. We did become at some point a nonprofit organization. So LeMay is legally a nonprofit organization. That's the system that we are um, working with right now. Um, not the best one, but the one that has allowed us to, to exist and to be a, a artist in practice, living our art um, every day, a very privileged way as well. And a lot of hard work as well. And um, so LeMay appears as a name a little bit after, you know, Chigi started Cave in 1996 and I entered the picture around the year 2000 and uh, about, in, it's very fuzzy for us, but somehow between 20, 2001 and 2000 something, we start working with the name LeMay, which is a Japanese word that means the moment that light purchases the darkness or the moment of transition or the moment of change, or the uh, space between uh, the transition between one era to another era, and that was very powerful to us because, as immigrant artists of the global majority, um, we are always in this really a space of transition and transformation. But I also think that is a condition that we all share as humans. Uh, we are we are all have ex been exiled of our mother's womb. We all were cozy and happy in the womb. And then one day we are born and then our existence starts and our, our question in between the social being who has an, an identity, uh, a name, a persona, and this other being that is material, this other being that maybe is some sort of a spirit, um, there is always a lot of in between those. And society always allow us to be living in one realm of dimension, which is the social being, what I call. And with Chige, we really make a life trying to figure it out how we can create harmony harmony are about all these ways of existence and how we can allow it in our daily life to have a space for these other realms of living. And that means what we say, let's live a life with poetry creating. So LeMay, it's now an organization that also runs an ensemble. The LeMay Ensemble is a group of uh, par uh, performers. Some of them come from the theater, some come from the dance. And with them, we start developing a practice that is rooted in the body. And like you say in your introduction, it carries the legacy of different um, um, artists and uh, movements. And one of them is uh, the Japanese Buto, let's call it, I'd like to say that I had, I had Buto dancers as masters and as teachers, um, but I don't say that we have a Buto company or that we uh, make Buto work. That's a choice we make very early on um, because of how radical these Buto artists were and the context in which Buto appear. It's very different to the context of today, New York City. And I am not Japanese, I'm Colombian. Um, but yes, of course, our roots and our legacy in it specifically in the way we are approaching choreography and dance comes from um, the Japanese Buto tradition, um, especially the way in this question, the materiality of the body and the way in which they bring Eastern thought to, um, to space and time. So for example, something very simple that I always share with people is what's the difference between I move and I'm being moved by, or I occupy a space and I become space. Just that little syntax change it really changed the way in which you are emb embodying uh, something or the way in which dance uh, 
the space dances you, the material dances you, and it's, it's removing a little bit this uh, individual as the center, which is so much of the thoughts that we're having these days on, on how we think of the human when it's in relationship to other and others, that existence in between and not necessarily the individual that lives alone. So community and collaboration is a big part of our work. And community and collaboration means that I don't only collaborate with Shige, we collaborate with the Lame Ensemble. Um, one of the um, uh, senior members of the ensemble, a person who has been with us for many years is Masanori Azahara, who has been sharing um, his, his work as a dancer, his flesh and bones. And then Andrea uh, Jones, who will be teaching the class later today. And this is like another kind of branch of this community. Um, but then there is also the artists in our ecosystem and um, the artists who are also putting process as a big value in their work. You know, like process is so important with us, just the act of getting together and working through the body. Um, and we were lucky to have CAVE, uh, which by the way, we spent six years fighting a big battle. We managed to change the New York state law by becoming a uh, citizen lobbyist and uh, being able to save that space in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. Uh, but a space has been very important, especially for artists who value process so much. So another part of our resume of things is that we share that space with other artists. So we have developed residencies, fellowships. And at some point, she and me were undocumented and we wanted to study. This is a, a bit of many years ago. And we wanted to learn from these Japanese Buto artists. We wanted to learn from people from the Grotowski Center. You know, we wanted to learn from uh, people who were not necessarily uh, that to, to study with them. We had to go and travel. So we also became presenters and producers at some point. And the New York Buto Festival was born in 2003. Before the festival, um, uh, we had a gallery. Chige started a gallery, Cave. Uh, which lasted 10 years. So I'm saying all these things here and there because I want to give you this idea of a constellation of like a lot of starts and a lot of circles and ripples and these humans that are like navigating in the in-between and maybe resonating, like becoming antennas, allowing ourselves to be resonators. And that's what I call the entanglement. So when uh, we're thinking now, we are here today to introduce an archive. Um, it was hard to me to say, what is this archive about? So hopefully what we're going to be doing is um, um, keeping the traces of all these resonances in some sort of container that maybe those that we haven't had the luck yet to meet, we can meet. Um, because it's also about um, resonance is great, but it's amazing when it actually can resonate further because then we can learn more of each other. And I'm sure that there is many communities. I have met many communities like La Maze, like Cave, uh, where people are really figuring it out how to live and work in a place in which you kind of determine it, your values, but you also in conversation with philosophical questions of existence, but you also a political being, and you also trying to be an artist uh, who can have a profession as an artist. So all this ecosystem, all this um, starts, all these um, little dots everywhere is part of, will be part of what we hope the archive is. We are in the first phase and um, Brandon will talk more about exactly what we did. I don't know if there's anything else. I say a lot, but what do you think? <laughs> yeah, no, thank you so much. It's, it's so much. Just give us an idea. How long do you exist? How many productions have you done? What are places where you performed? Okay, so I, this I have to look, but um, we had done about like, uh, at least we have 14 uh, series of video installations. Uh, we have done probably, I don't know when this was written, but it says 26 stage performances. Um, we have done also a lot of photography series and we have some work that hasn't been even published yet. 
we have been working a lot, uh, but it also helps that we work in collaboration. So of course we can produce a lot of more than just a single person can. And um, so CAVE, the space in Williamsburg, our home studio, our live work space was open in 1996. Um, and LeMay officially has been incorporated since 2001. Uh, so that means like the other day we counted 27 years. And um, the LeMay Ensemble, which is the group of uh, artists which we, we develop our practice, which we call Ludus, uh, that has the legacy and the roots on Bhutto dance, but we call it Ludus. Um, it's been officially, I think, since 2012. Um, so I don't know how many, my, my brain is burned right now. Um, yep. That's a little bit. Spaces next to your own place. It's it's spaces. Uh, we have, we have, of course, our home is uh, the place we a lot. We did a lot of work. We have performed at uh, the Brooklyn Academy of Music, at the Baum Fisher Theater. We have been at the Here Art Center, Japan Society. Um, we have been at the Brooklyn Museum, the New Museum, and uh, I'm Colombian, so now we are also working. We have been touring a lot to Colombia and, and Japan and Mexico, but we are just open. Um, and, uh, we have now a, a, a official LeMay company in Colombia. We are working with three amazing dancers from Bogota. They are developing a lot of uh, work. In fact, next week we have a video installation at Chelsea Factory, um, which was shot uh, in the Colombian um, Pacific coast and in some areas of Bogota. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Brendan. Tell us a bit. Hello, everybody. Um, Brendan here... has official <laughs> presentation. So <laughs> here and at home. So, uh, maybe, start, Tomek, we start. could put the light a little lower in the room so we see. I think, think that works. Yeah. Oh, OK. <laughs> I think you're still there. Hello, everyone. I think is here and, uh, and el elsewhere. Also for Howl Round, you know, it's good. Um, no, no, no. Yes. Leave it. Leave it lower. <laughs> Uh, my name is Brandon Perdomo. Um, I've been working with LeMay now for about six years, uh, now in the capacity of uh, operations and programs administrator. Never mind my notes, please. They help my mind from wandering elsewhere. Um, also, I find myself as the LeMay Archive Program Coordinator. Um, I, I arrive to LeMay with, and you, uh, with a background in public and oral history, uh, having earned my master's at Columbia. Columbia University from the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences in the Department of Oral History. Uh, when, when I entered this project of the LeMay Archive, um, it, it's already been long since in, uh, its own development, um, but is my own personal journey to, uh, to LeMay. Uh, I, I found LeMay and Cave by recommendation. And, and now it's been nearly a, a decade since arriving um, to Cave, home of LeMay, where I took my first class with Andrea Jones. I learned the word ludus. I meet friends who had turned to collaborators. And at this point, I, I didn't really know how deep I'd be getting in with, the, with, with these people, with these, with these artists. And, um, you know, just, just how, how deep that entanglement would go. All right, so um, oral historians describe the practice of what we do uh, as building history from the ground up, all right? Now, this has remained at the core of my work for the past several years, uh, building a collection of what I call testimony of the body by means of interdisciplinary storytelling, all right? So my experience of LeMay comes with a positionality of witnessing their, pra uh, their praxis through lineage um, and then fa fa fast forward and non-linearly, um, autumn of 2020, all right? Uh, we'd all be shifting and rearranging ourselves during uh, the time of COVID, global pandemic. Uh, I was approaching my studies. Um, Jimena was moving mountains, uh, advocating for the LeMay dancers and freelancers in total, um, while the cultural sector of New York City had uh, all been but frozen, right? So during this time, I had been caught in, in this thought of public memory and access of information. And um, through many late night discussions, barbecue, storytelling together, 
Uh, I noticed that LeMay, for all that it's done, um, from the New York Bhutto Festival to collaboration with all these famous musicians and the enchanting weaving of physical poetries, right? Um, including threading history through Rutledge textbooks and institutional residencies from MIT to California. There, there wasn't yet uh, an anchor for public reference to, to the history of LeMay. And, um, and that's from, again, 96, beginning as a DIY gallery to their being a staple of the Williamsburg waterfront still today. Now, the original idea for this um, was to create a visual timeline, right? Remember how simple that sounded? <laughs> from, uh, from the 90s to current of, of the happenings of LeMay. Uh, example, the gallery starts in 96 by Shige, enter Jimena. Uh, New York Buto Festival begins 2003. New York Buto Khan trainings, Ludus trainings. It was uh, very simply, or maybe depending, not simply, uh, a visual layering of who done it, what, when, where, and ultimately why. Um, for for me, it comes from you know my admiration of their cultivation of their crafts and from how I experienced it, their honest approach to meaning making and commitment to community, uh, dedication from and with Jimena's words, living a life with poetry. And that I really wanted others to see it. It's kind of desperate too. All right. So let's see if this works. Brilliant. Now, to give thanks where thanks is due. The first major effort of this uh, archival project um, in making the on-site archive accessible to the public in 06 to 07 was through the volunteer labor of Asian Cultural Council Fellow Chizuru Usui, performing artist Peter Doble, and artist Hiromi Yuchi. They worked uh, so hard <laughs> in digitizing their postcards, press, and uh, physical records. This is back in 2006. Yeah. These people started it. And, uh, and, and the, all, all that's contributed to, to the on-site archive and um, and fed into our work of creating this inventory and in their work in the initial database, right? And then the second concentrated effort was in 2013, led by volunteer Blakely McDowell of NYU, and uh, who's now a head media archivist at the National Museum for African American History and Culture. Blakely conducted a collections assessment of the LeMay audiovisual collection, um, including a visual, uh, sorry, spreadsheet inventory of all materials, all materials. Uh, and that provided a plan for the archives preservation. Thanks to this assessment, assessment and years of volunteer efforts, years, the digitization and preservation of 618 analog audio and videotapes was finally completed by Jimena's father, Jaime Garnica Briseño. All right, moving on. This evolved, and um, as we were digging into you know, videos, servers, old computers, ancient hard drives, and new network attached storage systems, uh, we were joined by interns, college students, colleagues, community members, and uh, this year alone, with uh, brilliant, brilliant, helpful community members and friends, uh, Emilia Berga, Carla Perez, Z. Baird Appleton, who joins us, uh, Sophia Romendic, and um, in, into very early and very late hours of days, of months, and accumulatively years, which her, uh, turned into uh, where we arrived to today. Three years. Um, of, of this push, many brilliant minds and an NEA grant later, um, though we still face applications to support the labor and resources of the immense work ahead of us, including further digitizing, database entry, and, and much more, uh, we're nearing the end of initial phase, nearing the end of the initial phase, along with thousands of hours of love and labor, from our community, which we celebrate today, we created a system. 
by use of <clears throat> this is this is the, where the where the nerd stuff comes in, right? Unless it all is, I don't know. By use of uh, media metadata and our own um, in-house uh, object ID codes comprised of a taxonomy system that that we put together, we categorized images and printed matter, including pamphlets, brochures, house programs, and all else into their own digital and physical envelopes. And uh, eventually I kind of splintered out and did, did some other homework. I, I visited other uh, Athenaeums, took workshops at the Brooklyn Public Library. Some of them even said, we make up this stuff on the spot. So we were in a good place. We were, we were among a uh, 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 crowd and it was vilifying, right? So moving on. Um, with, with the availability of this collected information, this data, the details of past events, um, presentations, and class sessions by master teachers, uh, the lectures, the public interventions, we had the information sorted into a database, which directly corresponds to an image hosting service. And then as of 2023, we've processed thousands of photographs and articles of printed matter from 27 years of LeMay history. From the Cave Gallery, again, 96 to 06, the New York Buto Festival, 2003 to 09, the New York ButoCon Training Initiative, and Ludus Training Programs, and numerous presenting series, including Outside, At Home, and Acts, among other programming. Um, and we're in the process of organizing, digitizing, and indexing now the works of Jimena Garnica and Shige Moria. And uh, all, all this was, of course, um, supported in grateful, uh, in infinite thanks to, to a web developer and LeMay collaborating artist, Irena Romendic in the corner. Thank you very much. There she is. Um, who she created a, a interactive portal on the LeMay website, um, which acts as a hub for research and public access and uh, and a tethered ecosystem to these archival materials, which today we celebrate and look forward to growing, uh, evolving, and maintaining as a living repository for the memory of the works and happenings of LeMay, as well as the multidisciplinary works of Jimena and Shige. And upcoming, we're going to be welcoming a specialist from the dance uh, from Dance USA as a summer 2024 archiving fellow. He'll be focused on cataloging previously digitized materials, composing complementary public text for video excerpts, and assisting with data collection and organization of LeMay's creative works. This was a competitive pool, a competitive pool from which LeMay had entered and was chosen to gauge with and enhance our methods of archive building. We're also gonna, uh, we also welcome Katie Dammers of um, Curator and Archivist, who's managed the archives of The Kitchen and worked closely with Jacob's Pillow as a consultant for the next phase of the archive. Um, and, and, you know, we, we ultimately, we wish to, to move beyond the preservation aspect to imagine an archive as a living entity, uh, which engages the works in, the world around us, which we're living today and for the future. Thank you, Brandon, for taking us to that journey. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. And I'm sure you found many surprising things. I mean, looking back or for you who, who entered, before we may come to those questions, maybe it's time to, um, to um, connect uh, to Tanya. Yes, yes. And uh, Tanya Calamoneri is a, a scholar and she wrote a book that just came out 2022 last year. Uh, by in Rutledge, which is one of the most uh, significant uh, publishing house for contemporary theater. I think it's on Buto Buto in the United States, uh, especially of course in, um, in North America and Mexico, 1970, I think to the 2000s, I think. So, um, and you, got, your company also features in it. So um, Tanya, welcome. Can you hear us and can you see us? I can both, thank you. Great to be here. Fantastic, so tell us a little bit, um, uh, you surveyed the um, landscape, you know, of uh, the Bhutto movement or, or, or artwork for the stage, close to it, inspired by it. Um, where uh, does Le May fit in? So Le May is in a chapter in the 
book called Gen X Bhutto, um, and I'm going to focus on them, but I'd like to start with kind of the archives that I went through to get to this process, and then some of the images that I got from, um, from Jimena. Um, I'll say that I met Jimena and Shige in 2003 when I moved to New York, um, and got involved in the Bhutto Festival, got involved in their company. Um, I had a little space also at the same time. I was doing my master's. Um, and then went off to do my PhD and stayed connected. Um, so it was an easy uh, connection to, to add them into the book. And it made a lot of sense, obviously, because they've been such a hub. Um, but I'm also really grateful that they were so open. And it's, you know, they're very busy and they're traveling a lot, but they sat with me and you know, I mean, multiple hours of going through old hard drives, looking for photos, looking for negatives, um, pulling out boxes from closets. And I am really excited that there is a, such a big push. Um, and I just want to highlight the labor that it takes to make an archive because it's very significant, the you know finances and then also the labor to maintain that sort of thing. So it's really exciting for, um, for future gener generations and, and researchers to be able to connect to these resources. Um, so that's super exciting. Um, let me share my screen, hopefully, um, and take you on a little adventure. So I'll start by saying my mother was a librarian. And so I was in archives and libraries pretty early on. Um, and I really, I love that the idea of documenting things and the fact that um, I've also been a dancer my whole life. I was one of those lucky kids that got to take dance classes from three years old. Um, but it was really, it's been a great process to mix those two things together. And, you know, part of my work as an academic is to write about the people that are important to me and have been important to me, to my development as an artist, the things I'm interested in. And a lot of times those are not the mainstream and the, you know, the dominant discourse. So it's been really rewarding to enter a lot of um, the Bhutto artists into this idea of archive. So this book that you so kindly introduced was, it's Bhutto America. Um, and I'm gonna take you through a little bit of the journey. So this is actually Kinji Hayashi, who was an artist that I knew in San Francisco um, and was in that ink boat, was in the first company that I, that's how I got involved in Bhutto. Um, but I ended up coming to New York and um, doing my master's at NYU. And in that process, I went to Japan. And so just highlighting the importance of archives, this is actually the program. Um, it's a marzipan hand and phallus and lips from Rose Colored Dance. This is in the Hijikata Tatsumi archive, which is at Keio University. This flag is also in that archive. Um, and this poster is also from that archive. And I don't, my, I've tried so hard to learn Japanese and I'm terrible at it. Kanji is really, really difficult. Um, but the fact that there's a little bit in English here, you know, I got to learn about um, the performance, the fact that it said 650 experience, I got curious about that. That had to do with the number of seats in the audience. Um, and that's not the kind of thing you find in a book or even find out in interviews. It's something that, you know, you get to touch these materials or see them and, and learn more about it. So the idea was that everyone is having their own individual experience in this performance. And that's why he called it the 650 experience. Hijikata called a lot of the early performances that. The scrapbooks of Hijikatas are also in that archive. So again, getting to touch materials. I had taken uh, workshops with Wagwari um, through CAVE, actually, um, through the Bhutto Festival, and then you know, was able to connect with those with those scrapbooks were in the Bhutto Fu, got to actually see them. Um, the other archive I wanted to talk about and that was really important in the making of the book and something that reminds me that like, there's a resonance in what LeMay is doing is what's happened, what you know, Ellen Stewart's archive at La Mama Experimental Theater Club. I spent a lot of time in that archive um, and was able to see the roots of Japanese experimental performance in New York that helped pave the way for Bhutto to be here. Um, so some of the early performers that Ellen Stewart brought, um, there's the Tokyo Kid Brothers in 70, and also Teriyama Shuji in 70. Um, there's multiple performances, and all these photos are from the archive there. And that's an archive that you can go in and research and, and find the connections. Um, so, But part of it is not just seeing the photos, but, but starting to do like a performance analysis and image analysis based on the work. Um, and the kinds of um, settings and and even I mean, costume or no costume, all of that kind of thing. Like there were Bhutto performers in Teriyama Shuji, who was a theater artist in his work. Um, fast forward or rewind, however you look at it. Um, I also spent time working with the Timanos in San Francisco. They also began kind of in this you know gallery space, similar to what um, LeMay was doing. So this was... Um, 
Koichi Tamano performing in a gallery space in San Francisco. And in research for the book, I went back to San Francisco and did research um, at their archive. And I, there's, I will loosely say archive, it is very much, you know, papers stuffed under books kinds of things in their house slash studio slash garden. Um, but I was able to pull out a lot of photos and digitize things um, through my PhD and, and uh, master's research. Street theater performances, um, they connected me to um, Esmeralda Kay, who was a punk performer in the 70s, who was one of the first people in their company. There's the Butoh Festival in San Francisco. And I'll add that I did research in the US and in Mexico, and I kind of purposely leave my slides, this mishmash of, of languages, and half Spanglish, um, because of that slippage. It's important to me to not sort of tell you know the American story first and then the, the Buto festival that happened in Mexico after because it really was a cross-pollination of artists um, through touring entities and um, you know just resources and that kind of thing. So um, the students cross-pollinated, the artists cross-pollinated. I've presented a lot in the US and in Mexico. So some of my slides are in English and some are in Spanish and I leave it that way on purpose. So these are artists from that were in the uh, San Francisco Buto festival. And then again, back to La Mama, right? Cycling through, there's a whole history of artists, Min, Tanaka, um, and these are also photos from the archive. Maureen Fleming performed with Min Tanaka on a tour um, in Greece. And then this was just another piece connecting, this was Senkajuko performing in Mexico at Teotihuacan. So there's, like, again, to show you that cross-pollination. This slide, like finding this, was actually a coup. Um, Natsu Nakajima posted this on her Facebook page at some point, it was like, ah, Proof that Butoh and Grotowski's work is connected, you know, from actual tangible cells. They exchange cells. Uh, this was from a performance that they were doing um, honoring Jerzy Grotowski's work. In Latin America, there was a conference, I think, in the early 90s, um, and Kazuo Ono and, and Grotowski and Nakajima were all together. Um, I want to speed through some of these because there's other things I want to bring up, but these are all the artists that are that are um, highlighted in the book, Diego Pinon. I wanted to land on this one for a second because this is another space that reminded me or I felt the resonance when I got to cave. This is actually Country Station Sushi, which is the, the Tamanos had this Japanese restaurant for many, many years. And it was posters all over the walls, Beatles music playing, Butoh books everywhere. It was really like a center that you could come and gather. We all went there after performances and, and cave felt like that when I got there. So it was, it was great to see that kind of resonance and the fact that, you know, the archive is not just the papers that we have, you know, the ephemeral pieces, but the, the living archive of the people as well. So these are some of the stories we try to capture through photos and video and interviews. But um, this, this restaurant became another restaurant. And then, you know, the Tomatoes now just have their, their own studio space because they're quite elderly at this point, but um, they were a hub for a long time. Um, speeding through some of these. And then I got to the Butoh Festival in New York and met all of these fabulous people. I had not met Wagori-san before that um, and Murabushi-san um, and Kasai-san. <laughs> um, I had actually known Yumiko Yoshioka, but that was kind of that first Butoh Festival that I that I came into. And met Himena through that process as well. And she was in the, in the process of a collaboration with Wagori um, doing this duet. And that was my entree to her work. Followed her through many other performances, got to see Furnace and then Becoming at BAM. I was actually working at BAM at the time, and that piece was there. Um, and then when I went back around to write the book, um, I had already known about some of the action painting, because actually this photo, I think I might have been around for some of these pieces where this is Himena um, performing with Naoki. Uh, but these are some of the earlier pieces of, you know, cave art space as an action painting kind of gallery and performance music space. So a lot of different cross-pollination of artists happening. Um, this piece really captivated me. I just, I just have to highlight this because I think it, it, it brings together so many things that are, are pivotal about this company and why I feel like it's, other people need to know about the work and it needs to get out there to a broader audience and, and it needs to be studied is because there, this was from correspondences in 2017. Um, many of you probably saw it, but it was in St. Mark's church in the, not in the church, St. Mark's in the plaza um, and in these large, you know, columns, they were plexiglass columns, and it was a durational performance, it was public art, it was dealing with environmental issues. Um, so this is where it's like that kind of thing that pivots off. Yes, their their lineage comes through Buteau, but but there's so much more that they're doing with the work. And um, I think it's just, it's so riveting to watch. Um, other pieces, these were all photos that 
were contenders to make it into the book, but um, I actually ended up choosing the the one action painting one, and then another piece from um, from this work from correspondences. Um, but borders, frantic beauty. Actually, let me go through a little bit. For those are artists in Mexico, <laughs> these are other artists that were in that chapter. Um, let me land on this piece, and then I I wanted to shift over to. I think I have to exit. How do I exit this? Nope. I need to be able to read you something, so I think I have to stop sharing. Um, and we can see you. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, now you can see me. Okay, great. <laughs> uh, oh, I have to hit escape. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about the artists in, in gener like the Generation X Buto artists and why I'm calling them that. So the people I, I mean, I, the, as you'll find out by looking through the archive, I mean, there, it's a lens into certain artists, but there are so many artists that branch off of it. And that's part of the beauty of the archive. It, like, it spreads out as a rhizome and then there's a deep root, right? That we're, we're trying to find all of those different traces um, in looking at the work. So I only could highlight, I mean, I have space limitations, word count limitations, photo limitations, but I got what I could in there, right? So I talked about um, this company, I talked about, um, Degenerate Art Ensemble, Ink Boats, um, and then two Mexican artists. Um, the one that was the one that founded the festival, which is Laboratorio, uh, it's leader. <laughs> it's um, Eugenio Vargas's company. And then Espartaco Martinez, because he was in that Aquaticon and then came back and, and does work in Mexico. So I want to tell you a little bit about these particular companies. Um, in 1990s, there was a, a new generation of American artists that were influenced by Buteau, and they began to form companies and collectives. And I talk about you know, attempts to, uh, to capture the number of artists. There's a whole bunch of websites, Buteau Nets. Um, actually, there was a Buteau Nexus that Cave Art Space did that was like a, um, a user-driven database. So there have been attempts to you know, archive the community of Buteau for a long time, but it's, it's pretty hard to get your arms around it. The artists I've chosen to highlight in this chapter include two Mexican artists and then a Japanese American artist um, with strong roots in the West Coast, which is Shinichi, a Colombian Japanese duo, Himen and Shige, um, and then another group of artists, a Japanese American artist who was in Seattle. Each of them had a significant impact on the formation of American Buto today um, through some combination of their aesthetic in interventions into Buto or their teaching and producing. These artists all share cross-disciplinary approaches to their work. So he may have mentioned in the beginning that some came through theater, some came through dance, some came through visual art. There's all kinds of different entry points into the work that they're doing today. In Mexico, Eugenia Vargas began in dance and then studied writing and cinema. And before teaching movement to actors at the, um, in Instituto Hidalgo. Espartico Martinez began formal performance training in Casa del Teatro um, in Coyoacan, but quickly connected his lifelong interest in writing and painting to the imagistic aesthetics of physical theater and mime. Both artists foreground a spiritual aspect to their work, either through connection to indigenous populations or projects designed for community. Shinichi Ovakoga initially studied filmmaking before switching to theater and then eventually began performing in the Tamanas Harp and Ha. He's been heavily involved in the experimental music scene in, the, in San Francisco Bay Area as well. And the song, uh, sorry? Have you five more minutes or uh, more? Uh... Fine. Yeah. Good. I can do. And um, uh, and yeah. Five minutes. Tell us a bit classroom. about yeah what you about Alain May also you know your thoughts about the company. Yeah, it's in the next paragraph. I'm almost there. Yeah. Um, okay. So uh, da, 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 da. degenerate art ensemble and um, Crow they began as musicians as well. They worked through classical studies, punk, performance art, getting their stage productions. And then Jimena was a child actress in Colombia before immigrating to New York to study theater. And Shige Moria was initially a painter who began experimenting with video when he moved to New York. And the pair are widely experimental in terms of disciplinary boundaries, spanning light, sound, movement, character, physical objects, and performance environments. Interestingly, the majority of these artists do not label their work as Buto anymore. Perhaps due to their passion for transgressing disciplinary boundaries, it is one lens through which their creative process has found focus. Many of them cite conversations with Japanese Buto artists, encouraging them to find Buto as the key which spurred them to keep innovating. I'm going to skip down to talk specifically just about um, Himena and Shige now. Um, and it's also interesting to note that a lot of them have been producers, like they were artist producers. So Minna talked about, um, you know, not being able to leave New York or leave the U.S. So they brought artists to them. 
other artists had different reasons, but similar effect that they began producing and bringing artists to their work, particularly Vargas in, in Mexico. Okay, so this is from, directly from Gen X Buto, um, the chapter on this specific generation. And look, it's the, the profile of LeMay. And um, it says, the work of this artistic duo has been vital to the contemporary development of Buto in New York. Their story is labyrinthine. Both came from abroad in search of their artistic experimentation and found Buteau through happenstance. They have played a pivotal role as curators and community builders, and now as artists who are forging their own path, inspired by those who have encountered along the way. Shige immigrated to New York from Osaka, Japan in 1993. His father, a respected visual artist himself, helped land Moria a position at the Soho Gallery where he had connections. Moria began to build a network of like-minded artists who wanted to experiment with cross-disciplinary work in ways the downtown gallery scene did not allow him to do. Together with action painter Naoki Iwakawa and Satoshi Imagawa, Mor uh, Moria converted a 3,000 square foot space, was, which was an auto body shop at 58 Grand Street in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, into a live workspace with two galleries. He called it cave because it was freezing cold and we had to make open fires to keep warm indoors. In the early years, the space hosted weekly salons as well as monthly gallery exhibitions that were open to the public. The majority of the artists came from the visual arts and music, and they were both experimenting with different media, including paint, fabrics, projection, and a wide variety of instrumentation. The space attracted and fostered further experimentation in artistic genre. Among the artists involved in these early years of CAVE were Ben Armstrong and Vladio Bolocco, a group of experimental rock musicians. Armstrong collaborated in numerous exhibitions of Naoki's action paintings. Additionally, Tim Wright at the American band DNA, a part of the no wave experimental music scene, frequently performed at cave events. Wright worked with Brian Eno and David Byrne, and he was fascinated with mummies and Mexico, two themes that Wright would find in common with Komor Bushi when they later met. Also Jack Wright, a free jazz saxophonist who frequented cave events, performed there with Azumoto of um, the Buto Company of Dada and let me skip down a little bit. You can read more on Shige in the book. Humana Garnica was also involved in theater at an early age in her home country of Colombia. She was a child television and stage actor and had also been exposed to, dis to distinct Latin American physical theater traditions that were based in Eugenia Barba's work. Garnica says that this was her inroad to contemporary performance as well. She was reading Barba's book, Theater Anthropology, in which he describes Japanese buyo, and this led to a fortuitous mistake later in New York. From Colombia, she went to Denmark to research at the Odin Theater to continue investigating physical theater. In 1998, she moved to New York to study English and later on to pursue theater studies. She attended the Lee Strasberg Theater and Film Institute and completed her BA in theater at City College of New York, but was left wanting a different approach for performance. Let me skip down a little more. Um, she went to a Buto workshop by mistake, thinking it was Buyo that she'd encountered in Barbara's book. That workshop led to, was led by Mexican dancer Diego Pinon. Because Garnica and Juan Marchand, with whom she met in, uh, at the workshop, spoke Spanish, they began to organize workshops for Pignon in New York. Garnica and, and Marchand became creative partners and brought other artists to New York as well. Uh, skipping down, after meeting Moria and collaborating on the things we step on, Garnica and Moria embarked on a new chapter of their creative work as, um, as they became interested in exploring the intersections of their different disciplines. Garnica notes that when she first came to the cave, she and Moria were already exploring art that was made live in front of the audience, action painting, action installations, and action interventions. It wasn't Buto per se, it was performance that explored liveness and chance. They even wrote bios for the studio cats, Franny and Zoe in the program, Action Lickers, who would regularly walk through and become parts of the art in progress. Okay, I will stop my, start, my part there um, and see if there's any other questions or thoughts. Well, first of all, uh, thank you so much for that uh, tour de force. And I'm sorry to um, cut it short, but um, everybody who's interested, really, it's a, a, an important book, um, a book that traces um, not the, the what is so highly visible, like what we say, another book about um, a Tom Stoppard or um, or Tony Kushner. This is a, a, one of those uh, books in the performance series that really looks at uh, significant movements and um, and uh, I think also you know, gives tribute and importance to what really is meaningful. So really thank you for doing that work and we can only imagine how many hours you spend in transportation and in libraries and writing, putting it all together is a big deal. So really congratulations on uh, getting that done. To a question to all three of you, what surprised you? What did you find uh, looking back at the archive to Brendan and also uh, 
Jimena, um, and then of course well, Tanya. First, I just wanted to say thank you to Tanya. I I didn't always, you know, it with Buto is weird because it it ended up like zacking everything, uh, but it was important uh, to us to a little bit share how the archive could potentially be used. And even though at the time that uh, Tanya came to CAVE to look into boxes and, and things, there was not an official archive yet, um, it, it ended up being part of, of this larger project that she had um, of documentary, documentary in the history of Bhutto in the United States and Mexico. So I just, that, just to put it in context, we wanted to invite Tanya today here because there is already somebody who have used this archive that is not even public yet. So just to an invitation to people uh, that once the archive is out there, that there is can be a resource where you could um, ask questions, have materials. I don't know about surprise for me, it's like weird because I just feel like everything was yesterday. So sometimes I look things like, wow, we did this. Oh, we did this. Um, I, I always also question the why of the archive because usually archive is something that people get when they die. Uh, so um, there is something a little bit of, I feel of an intervention of um, taking agency to tell our stories, to tell our own story. Uh, so I think that there is something that that uh, that sort of what is surprised me is the willingness of the community to jump in and wanted to tell that story uh, together because it's also their story, uh, it's our story. So I think that's the maybe it's not as um, romantic or um, um, intellectual, but but really that willingness of the community. Um, has been a, a big surprise to me because otherwise that this archive wouldn't happen. Like we're making work now, <laughs> we're in the studio. So it's, uh, yeah, that really surprised me and intrigues me. For me, I always think of, um, you know, you know when, when where, where I was in thinking about this project and, and making it public was like, I, I've been meeting people and artists and, and working with musicians and, and meeting dancers and taking workshops with dancers. And then I turn around and see like a postcard or a poster or a photograph. I'm like, oh, there's this whole web that I find myself in the middle of. And maybe it's, maybe the surprise is, um, oh, oh, how cool. <laughs> it's all just so very cool. And, uh, and to, to be able to, you know, put it in a place of like, look at all these people that are around and look at this early place of where they were around centralized in a place in a hub that you know other people have taken classes at and they're like oh i didn't know so and so is here how cool is that so the the memory of this space cave but also you know the memory of the the collective you know the the bodies and people that have been around it thank you tanya for you, uh, who looked at so many um, artists uh, who are close to the Bhutto movement, um, what, what do you think is special, what they did here? What makes them different from others? What fascinated you about Leme? I really resonate with their work. I mean, for sure. I think that's the biggest piece. I think it, it's, um, it speaks for our generation in a way that I find really compelling. Um, but I wanted to add something about the the, because I, you know, I've seen libraries for such a long time since I was really little, and now I'm in my fifties, right? So um, the technology has changed so much that there's there's a little bit of that Zen thing of trying to catch the live fish. You're never going to fully catch the experience, but the fact that we are constantly documenting, even the fact that this is recorded and will be posted on HowlRound and for others to see, like we're we're trying to catch that that sense of you know, the community as if we could, you know, I don't know if, if this technology existed when the factory existed, I don't know, that might be a dangerous, <laughs> like maybe we don't want all that documented, but there's something amazing about being able to document as we go and that artists are still creating and uh, developing work at the same time as they are trying to leave an echo so that the resonance of the work can, can reach even wider and affect each other. Um, and I, I mean, I think, like I said as well about the fact that the space itself has a community and you know 
I mean, I know that they're working on a piece about food right now and I'm being Jersey Italian, food is super important to me. You know, um, There's something really interesting also about that sharing food together. And that was something we would do at CAVE all the time after performances. And that is an open welcoming space where people live and work and sweat and eat and you know everything happens there. So it's that kind of family community that, um, that I think in many people, it's, you know, it's a substitute or, or I don't know, it's, it's a family of choice. Like it is very much, it, it reminds me of like, I wasn't around the beginning of La Mama, but it feels like that kind of community that, that created a center, you know? So I, I think it's important in that way. Yeah, and I also do think that uh, since we also at a university that the idea to document theater work is of significance, you know, so often um, work also focus for good reasons, you know, on theory, or how to apply is an actor's work, a director's work, a playwright's work um, to the theory and then make it fit to this theory and then say why the other thing doesn't fit. I think an archive in a way is a, uh, in, is a real look at the rocks of the landscape in kind of that post-structural idea. You do not impose a structure, but you show the fragments of what you did and it's real and it's truthful. It will be valuable for coming generations or even um, centuries. And so it will be um, something real. Um, strangely enough, as far as I know, there's no real archive of uh, the public theater and no real book. Um, it's the same of La Mama. I think the real book on La Mama, the history, I don't know where it is. Um, and others, um, also the Wooster Group, there's David Safran's book, but it's also a theory book. But what, it's just the weight of documenting what is there um, it is, is something that I think is of real importance. And um, and I think it's a great project that you take that on. I know how uh, complex and complicated um, that really is. And it's true uh, what Tanya said, you know, what if this technology would have been available in the factory time or the early Bhutto times, would it really work? Some say the end of the punk movement was the beginning of the internet because it didn't work anymore, you know, because of small movements of clubs where you went, you knew people, world by mouth, uh, you know, this was something very different and you can't put it on an Instagram or on a Facebook. It's radically um, different and you uh, worked in both worlds and now use this um, technology. Um, what do you all imagine, a question to both of you, um, what could come out of that archive, if it's true that your work is like an octopus, but entangled in different arms, there's teaching, performing, installation, music, uh, the archive now, um, will the archive itself be performed? Are you having plans of um, activating it? Um, what's, what's, what are your ideas, your visions in, in case you had the resources? So there is all something we say so much about what um, what the act of creation is for us. And the, the act of creation is, um, it's a way to remembering while simultaneously becoming. And it's a serpentine act of many resonances and echoes. Um, and usually in our work, that's what we look to, to explore and, and to delve into, into this multiplicity of uh, spatial temporal intervals that you know exist within the body, but between materials and also between environments. So I think the archive could be part of those echoes. Um, I have, um, I'm a, 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 there's something that I'm like, mm, I don't want it just to be preservation uh, or uh, uh, we started with that. That's the phase where we are like, yes, cataloging and wonderful humans doing that labor. Um, but I think it's already part of what we do with our practice with Ludus. So I imagine that there is going to be uh, more and more efforts in, in how, how the archive intertwine with the work that we are already doing, which is actually each piece of us has like a book and community conversations and performance and is already a rhizome. So maybe it's, it's kind of framing it and the archive is gonna help to, to sort of frame that that is already happening. So in a way that there is access uh, to the public. That's like, I, I feel like we're still in an unknown of what those faces will be, but I feel like I don't, we don't need another program, right? We don't need to like, we are artists we're you know like even though yes you are oral historian and you came to us and there are going to be archivists working our work it's still it's 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 
there is something about banking that works. So how the archive is going to be entangled into that current of the making of all these works, like Tanya talked about a meal um, or extinction rituals, which is the current piece that we're working on. Yeah, I, th I think you said it. <laughs> no, it's a it will be quite interesting. Do you plan since uh, Tanya's book is about you know the Bhutto movement in the Americas in a way? Do you plan also to host or dock on other artists? We had a big conversation at the Siegel Center uh, with Eugenio Barba, who is giving his archive. It's going to be in Lecce in Italy. He says it's going to have three rooms. One is his personal collection of books, artifacts. The second is the archive of his work, photos, videotapes, but also a digital one. And the third, he said, we're going to create a room for what he calls the invisible theaters. He said uh, he his real, he, real heroes are theater artists who in some small places and not did the work to transform themselves, to transform society without any commercial ideas. And they are unknown. Nobody really knows what nobody documents it. Nobody connects. And he feels it's a significant thing to have at least a memory of something um, there. So, and with Tanya's help or others, will, could you imagine that perhaps your tree will also then become a hybrid tree that you, you know, you're kind of, uh, Add some um, some other um, um, slices of branches from 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 other trees. Absolutely, I mean it's already part of our tree. So we have like the history, for example, of, of what we call the cave gallery. It was 1996 to 2006. It's 10 years. Every year there were eight gallery exhibitions featuring at least six artists. A lot of these artists are unknown artists to the mainstream uh, of the artistic field. And, and, and I'll ask you questions, you know, who, who gets to write history, right? Who gets to tell, who actually, it's a tremendous labor, right? So who gets to actually get the story uh, chair? So I think it's already happening. I love to say that uh, at CAVE, there is uh, like hundreds, if not thousands of artists, some of them who just, they're, they're part of our DNA now, just the same way that, you know, we had Philip Glass performing in our studio or Robert Wilson or Laurie Anderson, who are part of also that generation of New York City artists who had loft and live work spaces. Uh, there is also a, a big generation of immigrant artists who came to New York also just um, looking for a place to be in this relations with diverse humans, with the in-betweenness of life and existence. So I think it, it's already doing that, Derek Kai, once it's on, you will all, uh, it's not on our website yet, uh, but the first phase will be soon um, put up there. And uh, the initial phase, you get to see all of these hundreds of artists. In fact, you don't get to really see our work of performance or visual art yet, because we is still in the process of organizing. And I think that's hard for me, like to see you on work. I'm like, I already did it. I don't want to deal with how it's going to be shown. It's on its way. But with what you were saying that again, building history from the ground up, of course they're, they're you know, the well, more well-known, but then there's, you know, so-and-so that played clarinet for so-and-so's dance performance. And then, you know, and that that's, that's kind of the lore of the space and the history. And that's, that you know, the what what still I love that word Tanya used echoes that echoes within us and that carries us to today and to to onward going forward. I just want to add one little thing. Maybe actually, Frank, you can speak to this. But there's something about the academy. Like I came through the academy, through the institutions, and everything was kind of behind the wall. It was such a delight to get to use the library at Temple University, right? And um, but there's something so satisfying about an archive being available to the public. Like you don't have to be part of an institution to, to access this information, that you can access it and then you know, fold it into your own artistic practice or whatever it is that you're interested in doing. But I appreciate that there is public access to something yeah. like this. I, I think this is one of the great, also in, I think radical ideas that it is not membership you know, you don't have to be a student, you don't have to be subscribed to something uh, uh, for what happens in academia. The slave labor of students and professors, they don't make any money, but companies, you know, charge then for storing in the news projects of this world and um, th that you have this open, um, but they're also that it's organized and created by the artist. 
traditionally it is uh, done at Yale, it's done at NYU, uh, libraries, people decide, you know, what, you know, is important and what not. Um, some bit, and I think it's a very different approach if the artists themselves, you know, uh, do this. I think the ridiculous theater company got so upset that we're going to do our own book and we don't give our photos out anymore. And we, and, um, we want to be in control of our history. We actually had one um, author here who has lived in New York, teachers, wrote a book about the company, never met one person in life. They met the first time here when we said, oh, let's include him. You know, we, we celebrated 50 years of the company. And it's uh, shocking in a way. And I think the idea that archives are created by the artists in a way with the help and in communication as equal partners um, with, uh, with Tanya, you know, who is from the University of Ohio, right? Uh, uh, where you are, dance uh, actually the Ohio rare state. Ohio yeah, state, yeah, yeah uh, the rare bird, a, a professor of, of dance. You know, I don't think in New York we have maybe one. Uh, so there's none in the CUNY system. It's also shocking and wrong, I feel. So um, I think this is a great uh, contribution. So maybe uh, Tom maybe put up the light a little bit, and we have at least uh, already very much over time. But two, three questions, comment from the audience. Um, if anybody wants to um, say something. We went a bit over time and in 20 minutes, I think the movement class starts, but still I think this is important and we take it very serious at the Siegel Center. Matthew. It's, 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 uh, it's recorded. How does the access work? So soon we decided not to do it in the middle of the holidays at the end of the year, <laughs> um, but early next year, um, we're going to be uh, launching the the online platform and people are going to be able just to go and wander around and uh, click things here and there. And then we decided to do like the, um, this is like a web developer uh, talking, like Irena told me this thing, I forgot the word, but it's something like you start, you, you, you don't just wait for things to be perfect. You just put it out into the world and you continue like feeding it and making it more abundant. Uh, so that's what we plan to do. So sometime in February, we probably are going to be sending out and put it in, in our on our website for people to access. And again, in June, we have a fellow who will be working with the digitalization of tapes. So there's a, I think it's, a, it's an ongoing um, project. Join our newsletter. <laughs> Come volunteer too. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much for sharing your archive with us. Um, and I'm realizing the constellation that we share too. And hi, Tanya, it's Jess from Performance Studies Days. So um, uh, I'm curious um, about Shuffle, which I see up there, because one of the things um, as like a career, as a practitioner, but also continuing to be a scholar and juggling those two things, one of the things that my time at CUNY has been able to give me is that I have a social responsibility as a scholar to how I enter an archive and how I use it. Um, and I think that there's also agency that you have now because you're building your archive together. And that, so I saw this shuffle thing there and I was wondering if that's like the spirit of LeMay where like something might be able to get entangled and we'll be able to give that to an artist so that they really have to embody or think because like screens are so, challenging you know like it's public but but your your work is so visceral so anyway i'm just curious what shuffle is and if, if there's a some magic there that's going to happen i think it's just it's going to throw you anything we have done or any program so it might be from 1997 some gallery exhibit to some performance in the waterfront to some tour in colombia so that's the I think that's the shuffle. Um, but, but I think that there is something that we quite haven't put our finger on, which is also how, how we bring this element of environment uh, more. To, and, and I think it's, it's still, there is a screen, there, there is this. So that's why, for example, today we have a Ludus um, a class. And what we're doing is also sharing some of the teachers where some of this knowledge um, started 
and, and who cultivated some of the work of today. So today is going to be very specific about one very specific topic called Ludus Water. And there we're going to be able to show people in the archive who is Mario Sanai, who is in retirement, who were these people that did Noguchi Taiso, which is where this work come from, uh, so that we also are um, uplifting the legacy. And, and, and even though we're, yeah, we're not the only ones, but we are always standing in the lands of others, right? Like we are right now in Lenape land. Hi, wonderful talks. Um, I'm a young practitioner and consider myself a living archive. And I'm wondering, having gone through this process for you all, um, how would you look back upon it? And I guess, I guess I'm looking for a couple of words about what living archive means to you, having gone through this process now. I have to be honest that I have issues with the word archive itself. <laughs> um, you know, we're living organisms. We're for stories and experience and life. And I think about it as uh, sometimes I could think about this archive in many ways. In a personal way, it's like people who have journals. Um, I've been very bad at journals of my life. Um, but um, but I, in a way, this archive in a personal level, it's almost like a journal of all these people I have met. In my, like Sometimes I'm like, wow, I have lived with people from over 32 countries. Like I have had so many roommates in my life, like over a hundred roommates. Uh, so in a way, it is a living archive in a way. It's the, it's the resonance, the, the memory. But I know it could be so much many things. It's out there. Like for what it is for Brandon, it's going to be different. For Tanya, it's going to be different. As you saw, she's focused on Buto and on this and that. We are not necessarily only focused on that. But I think the living means like is alive and it could be experienced depending on how people are embracing or entering into it. Just like us, right? Who we meet. Yeah, I know we, we could go on uh, much longer. Um, we have to transition the space for the class. But I really would like to thank you for the presentation. I want to give you our respect for your work, but also admiration for creating this archive is something scholars should do in a way, but you say you took the lead. I think it's very inspirational also that you place importance on it. I hope you will do a book also that comes out of it. We would be help you at least in publishing. If we do it, you know, on demand, we could do, happily do that. So really it's a great thing. And I would like to, as a side note, also to say, um, that they, Michige and uh, Krimia, so they're two undocumented immigrants coming here to New York City and uh, embracing a city, a spirit of a city, uh, working through complications and in their work, uh, which traditionally would focus on playwrights, you know, of terrible conditions and living with a family or how the American, you know, police is missing others or, uh, and the immigrant, so, and they are all important ones, but this is also a transformation of an uh, experience in an aesthetic choice that uh, is global, it's inspiring, it is uh, uh, as existential, I think, as the place. Uh, we just had um, uh, Martina Mayok with us here, you wrote these beautiful plays, you know, of Iron Bound and Queens and all that, you know, who uh, tells the story of her mother, which is a wonderful flower that grows here um, in, in uh, New York City or in Jersey where she lived. But this is also a work of this company that grew out of New York City and represents the unique spirit, the global influence, and also chose a form that is a very uh, traditional, but also very new in expressing the, the loneliness of uh, human beings, of, of the existential angst we live in now in the catastrophic moment the world is in your piece uh, correspondence. You're making our work so dark, it's not no, that dark. No, uh, <laughs> but also what I want to say, the joy of uh, uh, of uh, performing, of uh, sharing, you know, as some Buddhists say, the uh, joyful participation in the sorrows of life, that is what art should be doing. And I think uh, is a great example, you know, of um, 
of uh, um, a company that is truly multi and interdisciplinary as the day today uh, uh, represents. So thank you. Thank you, Tanya, um, for joining us. Congratulations also on your book and I hope to see you here again at the Siegel Center. Thank you everybody for coming and thanks to HowlRound. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Us. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, thank you everyone.